ready? Just let me know. Oh, good. Okay. Just a quick question from my side in this, this sharing experience and asking what type of um, actions for a few that's already uh, in production where we have uh, most of the facility and top side already defined it. What type of, uh, it's mostly in the intensity that we can act or uh, it's also possible sometimes to, to have uh, some actions to to reduce absolute numbers of emissions if compared to a given base case. Uh, if you can share some uh, experience uh, on this. Uh. Yeah, there are things that are that we can work on that are, for instance, evidently to, to provide power from shore. Mm -hmm. That's sort of a no brainer in terms of emission reductions. You simply plug out the turbines that drive the generators and put a cable on the deck and put into a switchboard and then your emissions from the turbines driving the generators are gone. Mm -hmm. Great. That's easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can, of course, uh, use ECAL to evaluate that. Costly. Uh, ECAL is about the tool that puts in a position to be able to put numbers to your no brainer questions like that. If you try to do that, same for a turbine that drives a compressor train. Well, you can do that as well, put in an electric motor. Easy also, probably a larger scope modification, some downtime, probably large changes to your control system offshore also, but doable. If you're well planned and you have plenty of money. Those are the big projects. Mm -hmm. And surely you have to look at them. We are, in Norway, we are taxed on CO2 emissions. So the business case is influenced by how much emissions we remove. But those projects are typically quite hard to sanction because they don't give you added volumes. So the income side is only the that you can sell uh, the fuel that you use to burn. You can sell that. That's a good income, but pretty small usually, around five percent of your total gas production, depending a little bit on your situation. And you're reducing your CO two tax and achieving your company goals. Mm -hmm. And that side of it is actually quite interesting. Because if you're only talking about net present value, then how do you weight your company goals? Maybe your asset is met with an absolute target from the top management. They've done the portfolio evaluation. They said that you have to reduce your emissions with 100,000 tons per year. How do you do that? Then you're not talking about money anymore. You're talking about an absolute emission reduction. Surely, when they've done that portfolio evaluation on top, they have they need to know the effect of their measures. If they're just sitting on top and say, these three guys, they're not so important, they will have to reduce more. And then that could have a dramatic impact on their production. If you don't have a model, you don't know how much. So maybe it would have been smarter to take it on some of the prioritized assets because it doesn't hurt their production that much. So that's a portfolio part of it. On its installation, you need to know, well, energy efficiency measures. Well, if your water injection pumps are designed to inject at a very high reservoir pressure from early days, your reservoir pressure have declined, you can take down the lifting height in them to save energy. You can do something to replace the internals of them. That's probably fairly cheap. For the generators themselves, the turbines that run them, they're probably the vendors, GE and Siemens, they, you can buy upgrades. That's more costly again. These are pure topside modifications. The volt injection pumps, they should be discussed with subsurface, yes. You can do that in 
pairs. That sort of, I, I think of it's a cross-disciplinary thing, but it's low-hanging fruit. It's easy to do. You don't change the drainage strategy by that. But if you say that you want to shut off a water injection pump and save five megawatts with less water injection, then you probably lose oil. And then you need to think about, well, I now only have two water injection pumps in operation. How can I use that water more efficiently? I should make sure that I put it where it matters. Previously, the practice had been just over inject a lot. It didn't cost anything. But now your targets are more challenging and you need to think about what to put in there. Now it becomes more interesting with smart completions to put the water in the formations you need it, and you make sure that you have the sweep in the areas you need it. And then you're looking at reservoir studies. The topside studies become more supplementary now. The big and the hard questions need to be addressed by the reservoir engineers that have to do that drainage strategy study. That's why we in Equinoid put the reservoir engineers the tool at their hands because if you look at the bigger clean things in the longer run, the not low hanging fruits, it's the reservoir engineers that need to do that work. And that will then come up into the portfolio again and say, hey, I know a way to reduce emissions without losing oil because I can put this well in another location, I can put this smart uh, completion in it. It's not necessarily research, it's done by each asset in a practical manner. With a simple tool allowing them to evaluate it and then can put in that in as a batch job in together with the reservoir simulator, you can put that and it's just automatically done. Reservoir simulations take like a day. E calculations take like couple of minutes, depending on their complexity, up to a half hour, maybe if you have a lot of details in it. It's much more lightweight. And if the reservoir engineers invest a little bit of time in this, they get, get their fingers around this easily. They still need to spend time on talking to the guys that knows the pumps and the equipment, but uh, the two results, one, once they've invested that time, they can work more independently and then come up with a better argument towards the platform directors offshore, the management. Okay, long answer to your question. But a very great one. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Froda. Do they go on? Yeah, I think we can yeah, get back to the presentation slides. And, and if anyone else has any question, just please uh, post that in the in the chat or raise your hand, and then we can keep this interaction going. Otherwise, uh, please you can uh, share again your screen, Fruda. I think we lost him. <laughs> I think we lost his connection. I'm just uh, calling him again. Let's see. He's uh, joining. You're muted, uh, Fruda, but uh, uh, it I seems know. like we lost you for a second. Uh, I'm now on back. Yeah, now I can hear you and see you. Yeah. I don't know what happened here. Now? You can see it? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. yeah. And hear you. Yeah. Back to a slide with the black left hand side a step in the workflow number three build simplified process models the energy functions that we call them of the generators pumps and compressors 
This is the main part of the presentation. Item four and five are quite short. It might be necessary to mention that in real reality, item four is the stuff that we spend most time on in Equinode. And maybe item five. But I'm not sharing a lot of details on how we do this. We don't have time in this course, and a lot of it is done using feed specific data, which is not allowed to share. I'm just mentioning how we do it there. But this picture here is just a copy again of the Sankai diagram, just to remind you that we are not modeling everything, we are modeling the compressors and pumps and generators, turbines which has a dotted line around them. We build energy functions or models of the key equipment inside the dotted diagram to save time. And this, this part, I'm only going to talk about generators, pumps, and systems of pumps, compressors tomorrow. So this part is more easy to understand. Then again, some names, power turbine. We give them short names, we like that in the oil industry. GTC, gas turbine compressor, and GTG, gas turbine generator. And the sketch here, gas turbine. That's the thing from uh, GE, the LM2500. You burn fuel, mix with oxygen, create torque a shaft, and here is a gear, and that's just to vary the speed. And over here, a shaft that runs through compressor stages. This is a GT plus C, GTC, gas turbine compressor. And uh, more uh, stylistically drawn here, a turbine, which you put fuel into, and you also put oxygen, of course, that creates the torque. And the gas from your separator is going into this compressor here. These are just dumb. They're just a lot of blades mounted inside the casing. It has to be really seating and tight. So mechanically, not simple at all, but simpler than a turbine, maybe. But you put it in here at separator pressure. After uh, some blades have been rotating, take it out, higher pressure, put it in. In here, there typically are some things I haven't drawn, like cooler and a scrubber. That's just to cool it down again because I mentioned it, it becomes hot here. It is a problem for the steel quality. So put it into the second stage and then off it goes. Capacity in the system. Typically limited by the turbine exhaust temperature. The exhaust here can't be too hot. So if you burn more fuel, you will damage your chimneys and your flanges out of the exhaust. But more commonly, it's also limited by this temperature on the outlet side here. Or on the inlet side, if the gas velocity is, is too high. I point on the inlet here because on the inlet side, the pressure is the lowest, the gas density is the lowest. All the mass flow is the same all over here, nothing is lost. Having the same number of molecules here with low density, you'll have higher velocity, more volume flow. So that's why we look at gas velocities on the inlet side. If you think about it from ECAP, you'll actually you'll report the mass rate here. You give it in standard cubes per day, but inside ECAP, it works with mass flow, kilo per hour. So you can report that and check your velocities here if you have the diameter of this pipe. Of course, the temperature here is also reported. You can check that towards your equipment restrictions. It's not done by ECO, but you have the data so you can do the evaluation as a post-processing job. Very practical for real fields. Below this uh, black thin line here, we'll have the GTG. That's a gas turbine again, turbine burning fuel, creating torque, and but here you have the generator. 
the just rotating thing. So a lot of magnetic uh, things going on here. You remember Nikola Tesla from school? Well, that's the guy that's sort of behind this to create electric power. And here, capacity can be limited either by the exhaust temperature here, for instance, or this one. This generator has a maximum rating. So if you buy a small generator and a large turbine, of course, the generator will be limiting here. It, it can burn. The coil inside it can burn. So that's the naming, what they are, GTC and GTG. How do we model them? Surprisingly simple in ECAC. That heavy machine with all these lubrication systems and oxygen intake, we don't care about that. We are just using a table or mimicking the black box element of this. This is a GTG, a gas turbine generator model. Well, we know from my friends in the mechanical department, there are some loads, some percentage of loads. Well, if it's fully loaded, one by 100, 100%, it can deliver 21.4 megawatts. The efficiency, I know from my friends over there, that's 0.35 or 35.3 percentage. And then I have this formula here. Fuel is power times 3,600 times 24 divided by lower heating value and efficiency. I put it in here and I get a fuel rate in standard cubes per day, 131,753. These numbers here, well, you can Google them and you can relate mega yield to watt seconds is involved. So you see these days, 24 hours per day, 3,600 seconds per hour. Hmm. I can understand this. This lower heating value. It's a property of your fuel gas. So that one you can either calculate or call the lab offshore to get a number. This is a ballpark number, 35 to 40 mega U per standard cubic. So for each of these values here, and you have efficiency, you can calculate this. Well, how did you get those efficiencies? They, they are actually property specific. And if you ask the guys offshore or your electrical engineers, they will provide you with a chart that you have to read off. And this varies with ambient temperature. So I have hidden something from you here. But in essence, that's how you get it. But there is a black line here. And that's artificial made by me, of course. But it says, well, you have two generators here. But this one is fully loaded and you want more power. If you want to start another pump, you need more power, then you have to switch on the next one. And then it's operational practice to say, well, if I need two, they will be run in balance. So if, uh, if I run slightly more power, just 0.1 megawatt more, I run both at half the load. And you see here 50% here. 29% efficiency. Let's look at 50% here. Oh, it's the same number. And this here times two is this number here. That's how you build these numbers below here. These same numbers you see here are replicated here. That's just because I'm lazy, of course. But that's just, uh, easy to model this one. So that you see there's a jump in the power here. Well, that's not a jump, it's fairly smooth actually. But here is a jump from 131 to 159. And if I plot the blue numbers, you'll see this plot here. It's fairly straight line up to this jumping point, 21.4 megawatts, then you have the jump in fuel. So you fuel rate on y axis, power on x axis. This is the model of the generator set in ECALC. That's really simple. But if you have something that you want to model that varies with temperature, this is the limitation and you have to change this. And that's not so easy to do in ECOG. And you need to think.
This set has two GTGs, and there is a step change when you turn on the second generator. And this is the yellow here is just a syntax you need to put into ECOC. You put in this table the blue numbers, you store it in a file, something called mygenerator.csv, comma separated by the file, and you include that here. And you give it a name, my generator, for instance, and you have to say it is an electricity to fuel. That's a capital letter or keywords in ECOC. So that's how simple the generator models are. But now you have an insight into why they are simple. Water injection pumps, also quite simple. Just this is a symbol for a pump. So this is from the flow diagram, the bookkeeping diagram that you put some rate into it and you get some power out of it. Well, how do we model them? There, there are charts associated with pumps. These are vendor data. There's a, on the x-axis, you'll have rates. So the rate here is by convention in the industry, cubes per hour. On the y-axis, you have head. On this y-axis, you have efficiency. So the efficiency is increasing with rate in this example. And head is decreasing with rate. Maximum head is around 2,500. At that head, the efficiency is around 60%. And to, this is very simple, and you can just Take and write down these numbers at rate 270. You note down the head and the efficiency, and you do the same at rate 300 and 400 and 450, etc. That's your table of a pump chart. That's the dots here rate and head and efficiency at the same rates. Why is this all you need? The equations are quite simple. You can look them up in uh, Wikipedia. This is an incompressible fluid. I have to mention though that in ECOC you put in rates in cubes per day and pressures in bar are. You're not including rate in cubes per hour. ECOC converts internally. Likewise, head is actually Pretty, I'll show the equation, but it's pretty much the pressure ratio or pressure difference actually here. As a rule of thumb, divide this by 10 and you'll have the pressure difference. So 2,500 is around 250 bars pressure difference between inlet and outlet side. That is an easy exercise you could do in Excel. So then, this is, of course, something that you can do in Excel, and we can make exercises for you doing that. Purpose of having this in eCalc is just to integrate everything in one model, so you don't have to do something in Excel and compress as in eCalc. The so the input to eCalc is just this table of the dots in the figure. Uh, here, just illustrating to you what a sort of a rotating pump is, you have a shaft key, and outside here, which is not drawn, there is a motor, an electric motor, that when you turn it on, it turns the shaft. There are some bearings and things here. Over here is the housing of the pump. You're putting some water into this one here, and the, there are some blades you can see here that they turn when you turn the shaft, the blades also turn. That creates velocity, kinetic energy. So the blade transfers torque to the water as velocity. Then you have to look at the shape of these blades. So towards the outer perimeter here, the diameter increases a bit, reducing velocity. So then the energy is converted into Head or static energy. There is a link down here with a video which this picture is taken from that you can look up how it actually works. It's around 15 minutes, it's just supplementary for you to do. 
if you'd like to sort of get an insight into how the pumps are built and why the equations are like they are. It's quite involved, but uh, you can spend 15 minutes on that. But for us, head is this equation here. Discharge pressure, subtract suction pressure, divided by density and the gravitational constant. The units here are written down here. Pressures in Pascal, gravitational constant in meter per second square, density in kilo per two meters. So that's how you get the y-axis of the previous picture. If you put in the card, the discharge pressure and the suction pressure, and you put in the water density, it's like 1,000, and the gravitational constant, there's a number given here, then you can calculate head. So what do you need that chart for? You need it because you need to look up the efficiency. You need to know what the efficiency is at each rate. For a single speed pump, that's just a simple uh, interpolation in the table. If you have a variable speed pump, then you can go to vary with the motor here or the gear. Then you have to interpolate more in, a, in another dimension also. But the efficiency, that's the, this really equation here, density times rate times the gravitational constant times head divided by power. So this is why you don't have to put that from the vendor data, you often also get the power, but you don't need to put that into ECOG because ECOG knows about this equation. It just solves this. It uses head, interpolates and table to find efficiency and just solves for power. That is also doable in Excel. Well, that's why you don't have to put in power. Pumps. You must put in the pump charge as files into ECOG. You can have variable speed or single speed pumps. Single speed pumps are single speed, like the chart I shown you, that's more common. And pump systems, what are they? They are pumps in parallel. If we think about the chart, if I scroll back a couple slides. Let's say you asked for pressure difference 200 bars. That's around 2000 in head. Your capacity is around 550 cubes per hour. ECOG will automatically calculate between cubes per day and cubes per hour. That's just a factor of 24. But if you ask for this pressure and the rate of 650 cubes per hour, then ECOG would say, I need another pump to do that. So it will do that for you. It will switch on the second pump when you need it. It switches off when you don't need it anymore. If the rate goes up and down, or if the pressure requirements go up and down, it will solve that for you. There's something which is non-smooth in here. It switches on and off equipment. And that's what the pump systems are doing. We also know that pumps, they can have turbine drive. That's quite seldom. We have some of them. But most commonly, they have electric motor. Also note that there are some special cases. ESPs, electrical submergible pumps, pumps you put down in the wells for lift. Multiphase pumps, if you are thinking about flow lines where you have a little bit of gas, but mostly you're having oil and water. The pump models that you saw on the chart are intended for water, so there is no friction. There's nothing changing here. Therefore, if you want to use these other types of fluids where the fluid viscosity changes with the mixture, you won't get a result as you thought about. We are working with those kinds of pumps in the, in the Equinoid, but we are doing some tricks then. And the reason why we haven't included this is that, well, nobody asked for it. We have a couple of uh, fields that have ESPs and multi-phase pumps, but the workarounds work, and it's not so important for us to put our software engineers at work on doing that. 
something that somebody else can do if they want. The equations are available, but for now it's only water pumps. And if you want to do something else, you need to think. That is the pumps. Now I'll talk about pump systems and then and how ECAP does that for you, because this is a bit helpful. Self-optimizing approach to compressors and pumps. In ECOG, systems are defined as several pumps or compressors in parallel. However, generator sets are not treated as systems. They were this dumb table I showed you. So it, this only works for pumps and compressors. And in ECOG, we solve the systems in a list approach for each data point in the time series. Let's say you have a time series defined at each month from now until 40 years ahead. For each of those 12 times 40 data points, it tries this. Try condition one if you're okay, finish, else try next. Until condition n, if condition n fails, return invalid code. Hard to read. Well, it puts in operational settings, it's what you call it. That's a keyword in ECOG, and it puts that in a system setting. So if you put this in here, try condition one. Is it able to solve it with, uh, let's say, one pump? Well, true. Return the solution, I'm finished, and I return a valid flag. But if one pump is not enough, it's false. I go and try, let's try two pumps. If that is OK, return the solution with two pumps. And I finish. And it goes on until the last pump. And if that fails, it gives up and say, sorry, can't solve it. You will have to think about your input. Are you using more rates than your topside equipment can handle? Are you asking for too much injection pressure? It's important that the user checks this. It's a flag that's returned in the output file for each time series, for each type of equipment or system. Is it invalid? Then you have to check. Preferably correct. Now, this is self-optimizing, assuming that you put it in, in a sensible sequence. So if you had, if you tried two pumps at the first, and condition two was one pump, well, if it fails at this condition one, it will always fail at this one. That's not self-optimal. You have to put it in so that the objective function, their energy consumption or capacity is monotonously increasing. So self-optimizing relies on your brains. It's it's okay to have it like this because in reality, maybe you have six pumps at the most. You're not having 50 pumps. It's not that hard. So putting in an optimizer doesn't make sense. <coughs> it is, however, for those who have struggled with it, it is actually calculating all the combinations. All these conditions are calculated and reported in this auxiliary output file. So if you're having problems, you can actually just put it in and let ECO do the calculation and then look at this file. Usually that's not needed, but that's just so you know that it's actually doing it. It doesn't cost you a lot of computational time to do this. So that's why it does that and reports it if you ask for a special output file. Now, an example. Let's say you have four pumps, but they are not the same size. A and B are bigger than C and D. So the complex uh, sequence is a bit complex now. We don't know what's smart. So you try that. Then, well, you try one small pump. If this is feasible, go to the next. Then you try one large pump. If that fails, try two small pumps. If that fails, try one small and one large. If that fails, try two large. If that fails, try two small and one large, etc. until you try the all combinations. And these, this list is called the operational settings. 
they can be quite long when you have several pumps and they're not the same. And there, there is actually another functionality also that I'm not having time to go into here that you can show. If they're not same size, it doesn't always make sense to put them uh, balanced. So then you need to think about there is a way to solve that also. This hints at if that if you're having a pump system with several pumps, you think you can do this in Excel. Why do you need this tool for it? Well, good luck with that. Mm. I think you'll appreciate that uh, this tool is much simpler and easy to understand. You know the way it works now, and you can program this in Excel, but it becomes cumbersome. So um, something else about pumps. Well, I showed you the chart. It didn't start at rate zero. So what does it do if you try to put in a rate that's below the minimum rate? Well, we have talked to people offshore and they say, well, if you have rates lower than the minimum rate, there is a potential damage to the pump. So they need to prevent that so they have an automatic system that increases the rate in the pump by recirculation that's this mini flow if you put in this right here ECOG will automatically add the rate be making the recirculation to meet the minimum rate in the pump charge move it over here so you don't have to think about that. If you don't like it, you have to extend the curve uh, to zero. Now I'm hinting on what's happening in an ESP pump. Down in a well, you're not doing recirculation. If you're asking for a water rate higher than the maximum of the curve here, well, ECO knows from our talks with the offshore people, this is not allowed. So we return in feasible. The invalid flag is zero here. Then you can, if you have put it in the system, you can try to switch on the next pump. This is a variable speed pump, but you're not allowed to operate down here. You're not allowed to increase the head to go up here. If you're asking for something up here, so also outside the maximum head end rate at the head point here. So that's also infeasible. But down here, here we say, well, I'm allowed to do this. I'm assuming that the pump can handle the rate. It's at the minimum speed. It will lift higher than what you need to. So I assume that downstream here somehow you have a choke. So that's inside the software we calc. So it does this for you and you don't have to think about it. But you need to know about it. This is a picture from the documentation. And then over to the syntax part. This is the last slide for today. Uh, I think, yeah, Vinicius should have stopped me 10 minutes ago. This is just a syntax part. I will write it it's for lookup. This is an example of a variable speed pump chart. So you have a speed in the last column. You see there. Four first lines have the same speed, four last lines have the same speed. And the rates here, two sections, you could plot this. Get put in as a file here. This file here is given as a file here. You have to say it's a variable speed chart. You have to state the units and give it some name. And inside the model in the installation sections, this is how you use it. Put in the rate, the density, Operational settings, that's just how many pumps do you have? So when to switch, so on. You can have a condition that it, for instance, doesn't run if your rate is below 1000, because then you dump the water instead, for instance. We will probably stop the initiative and do this tomorrow. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good idea, Fruda. And, uh... Just a comment. We we do have a question, but I think um, we're, let's save that for tomorrow. In the beginning, we can address this and other additional questions that may arise. 
we are going to share these slides uh, for today's sessions with you, and then you guys can uh, think about uh, further questions. And then we start our section tomorrow with the, the doubts that you have for, from, from today, if that's OK for you also, Fruda. What about Google Meet? Should we try that again tomorrow? No, yeah, that's another, <laughs> that's another uh, information that I have. So tomorrow, let's go straight to the, the Teams in invitation. So, uh, Surani so has uh, sent an email to all of you guys with a new table with uh, the session and the link to access the uh, the meeting. So for tomorrow morning, uh, we're going to use Teams again, but this afternoon, we're going to go back to uh, Google Meet. And then, but everything is very well summarized and clear in the email that uh, was just sent a couple of minutes ago. So for now, I think we finished this session and then we come back at two in Brazilian time. So in one hour from now, in the Teams, uh, in the, sorry, in the Meet uh, link. Okay, and again, thank you very, very much, Fruda, for your time. Sorry for the, for the, the, the problem with the connections. And then tomorrow we meet and then address the questions that the, we may uh, collect this afternoon. Thanks again. Thanks for Thank you guys. having patience with the IT problems. Thank you, Fruda. Thank you, Dennis. See you guys in one hour. Bye-bye. See you now.